Well, this morning we're going to stay in Ephesians. We only have two more weeks in Ephesians following this as we wind down this series. Next week I will be gone. I'll be on a staycation, and Pastor Tom will be here Sunday morning. Uh, we're thankful for him. I'm thankful that you've afforded me that opportunity to take my uh, first week this year to just relax. So I'll be a uh, staycation unit here, here in town. So I'll still be available at, at your disposal. But we're looking at Ephesians, and remember, it's based on Revelation 2 when Jesus told them that they had left their first love. We went back to Ephesians and we remembered what Jesus said, what he told us to do, which was to go back and remember. So we've seen what God the Father has done for us, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We looked at Paul's two prayers for us, that we would be filled with God, that we would be filled to the full measure, and know the height, the depth, the length, and the width of his love for us. That was his hope and prayer. That God would love us so much that that would be his desire for us. And we also saw how much Christ loved the church as we looked at that example in marriage. We then saw how to love him by being an imitator of God, mimicking God in how we live our life. That we are to walk in love. We're to walk in the light. And we're to walk in wisdom. And as we do this, we'll be mimicking the Lord with a love that will grow for him in our service to him. We saw that God, loving God, we would love people. And we really are going to be looking at that as we close out the series in the upcoming weeks. But today we're going to look at a major, major thing we need. A major weapon we need to accomplish this, loving the Lord and the battle we're in. We really need to get to this part of Ephesians and come to a real understanding if we don't know already. Or a reminder of what is really going on around us. Please turn to Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done, done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, the word of the spirit, which is the word of God. This morning, we are not going to look at every part of the battle armor. We're going to focus on one part of it today. One part of it today. So we won't be going through every aspect of the body armor, uh, which is needed. We have sermons on that. Please go to our website and listen. You can hear about every part of the body armor. But today, we're going to streamline our focus. Lord, I just thank you for this day that we can come and that we can worship you in freedom and peace. But Lord, though we feel physical peace in our country, we are not in a civil war. We are in a spiritual war. Lord, I pray that as we see this, as we hear your word today, that Lord, we will use what we've heard, that we will apply it to our life. And Lord, that we will with passion pursue you with a love that flows right from the depths of our soul as we remember you, dear Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So right out of the gate, what we have to look at is the battle we are in. The battle we are in. So right now, God, through the Apostle Paul, reveals to us that every born-again believer is in a battle. Depending where you're at in your life or what circumstances you have going on, each and every day you're in a battle. We must realize there is a war on. There is a war on. 
This topic is not talked about much in the church today, but if the church can get back and realize what our purpose is, realize the condition we find ourselves in, we would shake up the world. Amen? This is no joke. We must seriously realize this and respond with the same attitude a real soldier responds to when that soldier enters into a battlefield. Can you imagine a real soldier who's going off to war? How do they enter into battle? Not nonchalantly. They go aware, awake, ready, and prepared. This is a battle that Paul tells us will require the full armor of God in verse 11 and 13. And it will take strength, in verse 10, of God to wage this war victoriously. Paul tells us this straight out. It is a battle in which we must struggle, verse 12. Struggle. This word struggle is a word used in Paul's day of wrestlers engaged in hand-to-hand combat. Wrestling, hand-to-hand, grappling, combat. This is a word used in the King James as wrestle. The image of a hand-to-hand combat Paul is giving here emphasizes what he wants to emphasize to us, that in a personal nature, this is a struggle. You personally are in a battle. You personally are in combat. It's not just collectively where you get to sit on the back lines or you're in the rear with the gear. You personally are in a hand-to-hand struggle in a hand-to-hand combat. If you are not wrestling in your life, if you are not fighting or you're not struggling in battle for the Lord, then somewhere along the line, a part of you has left your first love or you've been defeated or you're in the middle of being defeated. How many have been there? I've been there. Have you been there? We've been there. But praise God if you know you're in the battle. Praise God because you're in it, right? Our struggle, hand to hand. I don't know about you, but I haven't been in a real fist fight in a long time or in a wrestling match for as long as I can remember. And I pray the same, you can say the same for yourself. This isn't about physical combat. Paul's giving us imagery here for us to understand the nature that this is spiritual, right? You see, our struggle is not with the physical foe. That's not what it's being talked about. It's not in verse 13. Against what? Flesh and blood. The real battle is in the unseen world with real supernatural foes. Real enemies that exist. As an example, remember when Peter rebuked, uh, uh, when Peter rebuked Jesus for announcing his coming suffering and death? What did Jesus do? He looked past the flesh and blood, Peter, and he addressed the real unforeseen foe at that time, and he said, get behind me, Satan. He went right to the real foe. Get behind me, Satan, in Matthew 16, 23. And here was the devil himself. Here was Satan trying to use the sincere but unsuspecting Peter to dissuade Jesus from his mission to die on the cross that sinners may live. To die on the cross as a substitute For us. Spiritual warfare. You see, ours is a spiritual battle against a spiritual army, verse 12, whose commander in chief is Satan himself. Verse 11, the devil himself. That's who we're up against. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. He is your enemy. And believe me, he hates you And he knows you're his enemy. He knows you're his enemy. This word devil is the Greek word from which we get our English word diabolical. Meaning cruel and wicked. Satan and his forces are cruel and very wicked. The Greek word means to slander or malign. So Jesus called him what he was. He called him the evil one. And he told us to do something. He told us to pray daily that we might be delivered from this evil one. We must understand right up front, the way we wage war, the way we wage battle in this spiritual battle is with Jesus Christ right up front. It's through him we have victory. The devil, the evil one, is a real person. 
spiritual warfare with him and his forces relentlessly. There are studies out where percentages of the church today don't even believe he's real. He's a force. And if you're sleeping right now, this is a good time to wake up. You're in a battle right now. If you're asleep, you're in a battle. Stand up, go to the rear. Stay up. Don't sleep. Please. Ephesians 6.12 describes his army. It says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. There's a description that describes his army. All of these terms that you read of in verse 12 describe a host of subordinates. All of these subordinates are demonic, okay? They're of differing ranks of demons and the evil realms that they operate in. This is a very serious opponent. So just like there are good angels, right? Of various ranks and roles, we see that in Ephesians 3.10. The same is true of the kingdom of Satan. In other words, everyone... Satan's army is not some uncoordinated mob, but a highly organized empire of evil and darkness. It is a highly proficient military with a massive arsenal of weapons that is seasoned, trained, and they are battle-hardened. These are no rookies. They are not newbies. They're not new to the battle. They have not just graduated from basic training. They're a serious foe. This uh, military of Satan's is veteran, everyone, to its core, and we should not take them lightly. Notice who our battle's against. It's against the schemes of the devil. We get our English word here, methods. Satan has his methods to attack you. He has his schemes to come after you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, we are not ignorant of his schemes. So he cannot take advantage of us, it says in 2 Corinthians. Or at least we should not be ignorant, right? Amen? We shouldn't be. Think about this real enemy for a minute. The devil, Satan himself, he is a created being. He was one of God's highest ranking angels. But when in his pride he revolted against God... He and his angels who joined him in the revolt, they were cast out of heaven. These fallen angels, his angels, we see in Revelation 12, 9, are now the demons that make up his army today. Demonic forces, demonic powers are real. They're here. Satan and his angel demons have been around since creation. They've been around longer than you and me. Amen? Angels do not procreate. There are, there are no new angels. There's no new little cherub demons. There's no new little cherubs. Angels, good or evil, do not die either. Therefore, Satan has a well-tuned spiritual warfare guy. He knows what he's doing. He's been at it a very long time. Which means that every scheme... Every method of the devil and his demons has been fully tested. It's been fully perfected over generations and generations and generations of mankind since creation. Satan has a well-tuned, well-funded spiritual warfare machine and a spiritual warfare guide. He and his army are old campaigners, everybody. They know what works. We're in a battle. We must understand what we're up against. You see, our war is with a battle-tested foe. He's a battle-tested foe. Also, this devil, Satan, and his demons have tremendous power. They are incredibly cruel. They're incredibly hateful. They have a relentless hatred of God, a relentless hatred of you, his people. Think about that for a moment. Look at the zeal of Satan. Have you ever stopped and admired anything about Satan? Don't. The Bible doesn't tell us to admire him. But look at his zeal. Look at his hatred. 
Look at his way that he goes about what he does. The zeal of Satan. Hmm. When you look at his zeal compared to the zeal of the church. Does does the church have the same zeal and love for God as Satan has zeal and hatred for God? If our hearts burned with the love the Lord wants for us to have for Him, if it burned with love, like a honeymoon love, and it stayed burning and on fire for the Lord with the same zeal with which Satan hates Jesus and the church, we would live victoriously. We would live transformed lives. We would love the Lord at all costs, and we would have an eternal perspective that does not grow weary and does not dim out. The devil and his army of demons, they never tire. They just don't tire out. They never slack off in their hatred or their efforts to corrupt us. They never slack off or take a day off to come to harm you, to defeat you, or to hinder God's kingdom. That is their sole purpose, and they're relentlessly pursuing it at all costs. They make the worst terrorists look like Cub Scouts. They're so evil. So no wonder, is it any wonder we're told to put on the full armor of God? Praise God in His grace, He doesn't just save us. This is why I love grace. In His grace, He walks with us. He talks with us. He sanctifies us. And each step of the way, He gives us the tools Necessary to follow him and be victorious. Grace, do you deserve it? No, but in his love, he's given it to us. We are to put it on and we're to keep it on, not put it on occasionally and take it off as we so often do. No wonder Jesus told, said to pray daily, Deliver us from the evil one, Matthew 6 13. I wonder when you really contemplate your prayer life, how often you pray. Deliver us from the evil one today. Deliver me today. Keep my eyes focused on you. Is it something you're super concerned about in your warfare or in your life? You see, the battle we are in, we must come to grips with this. It's every second, every minute, every hour of every day. How many know when you feel most safe, most comfortable, things pop up in your mind? Things pop up in your heart? There's not a moment that Satan isn't going to look to attack you in your spiritual life. It is a lifelong uh, uh, warfare against an enemy that never takes a day off. Here's the thing, guys. Don't make peace. There is no peace treaty with him. Don't compromise with him and don't strike deals with him. He's an enemy that never takes a day off and never will make peace with you, whose only goal is to destroy you and to destroy your family, to destroy those you come in contact with. So do we see the battle we are in? We could go on and on speaking about this battle, right? We see the battle we're in. Let's look at the orders we have been given. It says we are to stand firm, then I be hold your ground. Stand firm and hold your ground. This is a crystal clear command and it's given three times. You'll see it in verse 11, verse 13, verse 14. We are to stand firm and hold. Hold your ground. Paul's still speaking in military terms. He wants to show us this imagery so we understand and take it over to the spiritual world. Let's get this straight out of front. We do not fight spiritually the way the world fights, right? We love people by loving God. We also fight inwardly, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, as we want to serve God and not allow sin to reign in our lives. We're fighting against Satan and his principalities, our sin natures. So I want to get it strong, very clear up front. We're not here physically fighting the way the world does. The imagery is here for us to understand, to apply it to us in spiritual battle. Amen? So this is stand firm, hold your ground, is a military term referring to holding a critical ground that is under attack. This isn't a fortress that's no attack going on. This is ongoing attack, holding your ground that's under attack. We are to, what, verse 10, be strong. We are to, verse 13, resist. You see, here's the beautiful thing. God does not want his people to fear, 
to falter or faint or flee before the devil and his demons. When you have your armor on with the Lord, the battle is yours. The battle is yours. You have the ability to be victorious. You have the ability to win each and every time. The battle is yours. World War II. December 16, 1944. Hitler and Germany were on the ropes. Hitler ordered what would be the last major offensive of World War II, the Third Reich, uh, was going to uh, put on. They did an all-out blitzkrieg, which was launched against the battered, weary, hungry soldiers, cold and tired, the 101st Airborne Division in Bastogne, which was a small battle and the larger battle, the Battle of the Bulge. How many have heard of the Battle of the Bulge? Okay, this is what's going on. The 101st Airborne Division is pinned down. It was a brutally, brutally cold winter. And they lacked supplies. They lacked food. And they were very tired. They could get hardly any rest. They were soon surrounded. One division, a little over a thousand men, surrounded by a quarter million men of the 47th German, German Panzer Division. Odds are bad, right? The fighting was intense at times. And the constant shelling of the Germans was taking its toll. They were constantly being shelled and fired upon. They went from times of extreme cold and extreme silence, so when you wanted to sleep, you couldn't because the enemy would attack you at any given moment. Extreme cold sites where they had to remain alert, and they had to stand their ground. They had to stay the course. They had to stay firm. To moments of massive engagement while battling their hunger, fatigue, and freezing conditions. And they did take their fair share of losses during the battle. After a week of this, after a week of fighting on December 22nd at 11.30 a.m., four German soldiers approached the Americans waving white flags. Asking to deliver a letter to the American commander, Major, uh, the German commander, Major Wagner, sent to the American commander, Brigadier General Anthony McCullough. When they got through the lines, the one soldier went in, and this letter stated how outnumbered the Americans were and how futile it would be to continue to fight. It's futile for you to continue to fight, and they needed to consider surrender. And the letter read this. There is only one possibility to save the encircled USA troops from total annihilation. That is the honorable surrender of the encircled town. In order to think it over, a term of two hours will be granted, beginning with the presentation of this note. If, when you go on to read the letter, it says if they don't surrender in two hours, they will be annihilated. Here's the official response, December 22nd, 1944. To the German commander, nuts, the American commander. Nuts. When the Germans received the reply, the German commander asked, what does this mean? One of his uh, younger officers says, I don't know what it means, sir, but I believe it means they're not going to surrender. This was a bastone at the Battle of the Bulge, which turned out to be the most ferocious of all costly battles of World War II, but the victory was won. Where is the attitude of that today in your life? Where is the attitude of that in the church? Even when all the odds seem stacked up against you, even when you feel like you're being defeated, even when it's cold, even when it's, you're tired, even when you're weary, even when you're hungry, say nuts to the devil and his demands, his threats and his temptations. Say nuts to the thought of any form of surrender to him and giving up and stopping and falling away. Say nuts to living with depression in your life. Don't live with anxiety, fear, Apathy, complacency, lust, greed, strife, jealousy, anger, bitterness, laziness, indifference, and apathy. Say nuts to that, Satan. I will not surrender and be defeated to you. I'm going to stand on the principles of the Word of God, and through the strength of the Lord, I will be victorious. We can live victoriously. Do you believe that you can live in victory? Do you believe you can live with the power of the Lord at your side? dwelling in you and richly flowing through you. But notice something here 
that Paul never talks about in the battle armor. There is no armor specified for your backside. Have you noticed that? There's no armor specified for the back of you. Only the front. Implying a very biblical truth that we are never to turn our back, never to turn off the battlefield and turn our back to our enemy. Jesus talked about this in Luke 9, 62, when he talked about looking back when you put your hands to the plow. Once you turn, what happens to us? Once we get our uh, minds unfocused or off the enemy and we allow things to happen, what happens to us? We yield. The enemy sniffs this out and the, he starts smelling the victory. He will mount a charge to finish you off. Or at a minimum, he will mount a charge and use that to take more ground from you, only to turn around and have to take that back. Don't turn your backs on your enemy. Stay focused on the Lord. Stand, says the Lord, and stand firm. And we can stand, for we do not stand in our own strength, but we stand in the Lord's. Verse 10, be strong who? In the Lord. And in who? His strength. In the strength of His might. Please, know this. We should never underestimate Satan's power, but neither should we overestimate it. Amen? Amen. Don't over, don't underestimate him, but don't overestimate his power. We should never underestimate, but never overestimate. First John 4, 4. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Amen. And you have him in you. James 4, 7. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The very fact is, we saw this in Men of Valor. It's the very beginning of that verse. Submit to God. Who is your commander? Submit to him. First Peter 5, 8, 9. But resist him firm in your faith. Oh, that's right. You have power, power, wonder-working power living in you. You have the ability to fight. You have the ability to conquer. You have the ability to win. We have the Holy Spirit within us and the resurrection of power, of Jesus, uh, 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 the power of Jesus who was resurrected from the grave. In us. Ephesians 1, 19 through 20. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. That power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives in you. Praise God for that. Don't walk in fear. Satan may not be the prince of the world. I mean, he may be the prince of the world, but he is not the prince of the people of God. Colossians 1.13 says, For what did Jesus do? He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Praise God. I'm not of that world anymore. And I don't have to be beaten by it. I've been transferred to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. See, something remarkable has happened because we have been rescued from Satan's realm. Do you know what that is? Something remarkable. Because we are now citizens and children of God's kingdom. You are now a new creation. Something you must realize. Especially when this enemy has you in a headlock. Especially when you feel he's getting the better of you. You must remember who you are in Jesus Christ. Satan's power to reign over us is gone, my friends. He may tempt, but he cannot compel you. He may tempt you, but don't let him compel you to do anything you don't want to do. He may tempt, but he cannot force you. He may be mighty, but he cannot stand against the almighty power of the almighty God. You have victory. You can have the victory each and every day. David said this in Psalm 60, 11 through 12. Oh, give us help against the adversary. For deliverance by man is in vain. Through God we shall do valiantly, and it is He who will tread down our adversaries. Praise God. God will wage war for you as we serve Him and put Him first in our life. So remember this and stand firm. We've seen the battle we are in. 
the orders we have been given, stand firm. And here comes my last point. This is a United States soldier who's been through infantry school, a first lieutenant in the U.S. Army, real soldier. The Apostle Paul talked to us in the day about the Roman soldier, right? If you were to look at a U.S. soldier, or he was to look at a soldier today, you would see a soldier like this. He's not in all of his battle gear. If he went into full battle, you would see a rucksack on him. You would see many other things. You'd see night vision, goggles, but he's prepared to go to battle. Does this look like somebody who's prepared to go to battle? Does it? He has his helmet on, his vest on, his boots on, his knee pads on, elbow pads on. He's ready to go. Ready to go fight. Been through training. Been through basic training advanced individual training, is in good physical shape, can run, can do everything required of him as a soldier. But what would happen if you put him into battle right now? What would happen to him with all of his training, with all of his knowledge, if we dropped him part of the Airborne, went through Airborne School, like the 101st Airborne Division? What if he dropped into enemy lines right now? How long would he last? In battle. What is missing for you to go to battle? Now is he ready for war? How do you see yourself as a Christian? Do you even have any of the armor on? Where is your weapon? How are you going to fight this spiritual warfare where Satan wants to destroy you? How are you going to be used for the kingdom of God? Thanks. Is there anyone more liable to suffer defeat than the warrior is without his weapon? How will he not only avoid suffering major defeat, but how will he inflict defeat upon his adversary? That brings us to this final point, the weapon we are to use. If the church in the world today is to be victor, If you're to be victorious in your life and not a victim in this great spiritual war against the schemes of the devil, his methods, his lies, his deceitfulness that characterizes Satan, that characterizes uh, his army, the church today must take up its weapon. The church must arm itself. The weapon is the sword of the Spirit, verse 17, the very Word of God. It is not only one of many weapons. It is your only weapon. It is the weapon. The only weapon. And that weapon is more than enough. Praise God. It's more than enough to get you where God wants you to be. It's more than enough to have victory in your life. It is not one of many weapons. It is the weapon. We need to armor up, my friends. Verse 13. Take up the full armor of God. Who wants to armor up in their spiritual life for God? Who wants to love Jesus Christ the way he wants us to love him in all aspects of our life? All you must do is one thing. You just have to do something. You just have to do one thing. Take it. Take it, my friends. We don't have to make it. It already comes ready made by God for the battle. Your body armor, your sword. It's already made for you. You just have to take it up. And guess what? This body armor, this battle that you're going to use to go into war, it fits each one of you perfectly. It's not uncomfortable or heavy. It won't shake your skin. It won't put blisters on your feet. It won't get you overheated. 
In the military, I remember being in the military in a basic training, one thing to graduate, my boots made my feet bloody. We had to take 80, 90 pound rucksack and we had to march 10 to 12 miles in the foothills of Alabama. By the time we were done, it wasn't just me, it was my whole platoon. Our feet had bloody blisters all over them. They had bad boots back then. On a 10 mile force march. You see, the earthly soldier, his gear makes him very uncomfortable. His feet will start hurting, his back will ache, and he will have rashes in places he doesn't want to have rashes. He will be one uncomfortable guy. But with God's gear, there's nothing to fear. It's tailor-made just for you. Amen? How many of you seen that program, Forged in Fire? It's on the History Channel. They come and they compete and they make swords, and the winner's the winner. It's a contest in which men are challenged to forge swords and then uh, they are tested to see which sword is the strongest. And the winner gets $10,000. After testing, the blade is examined to see if it is damaged or if it has lost its edge. There's a strength test, a sharpness test, and a kill test. If it passes all the tests, the man uh, testing the sword, his name is David Markaida. He's a martial arts and weapon expert. He will say, it will cut. It will kill. These man-made swords, though, they will have hairline cracks in them, uh, delaminations in them, and imperfections, and they can break, and they can lose their edge. The steel, many times they'll overheat it or they'll overtemper it, and it will uh, have many imperfections in it that deteriorate its effectiveness. It looks good on the outside, but when it's put to the use, it may be destroyed. You see, the sword you are to take up, the sword, the Word of God, it has been designed. But it has been designed and it has been forged in the mind of Almighty God. And it has no imperfections, it has no weaknesses, and it's sharper than any sword made by man, praise God. It's been forged in God's mind and given to you. The sword of the Spirit, it never loses its edge. It never loses its sharpness. In fact, it gets sharper in the hand of those who grow proficient with it. The more you swing it, the more you yield it, the more victory you have, the stronger it becomes and the sharper it becomes and it is ready and always there for you to use. Praise God. Wow. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is what? It is living, read it with me, and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This sword will cut to the heart of man, and it will slay something. It will slay, 2 Corinthians 10, 4-5. You want to know what it slays? Every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of Almighty God. What a weapon. What a weapon. One swipe of this divinely powerful weapon of truth will cut down the false mental fortresses and speculations that mankind lives in. One swipe of this will cut down every form of battle that comes against you where you can live victoriously. You see, human reasoning is but a useless wooden sword, and the devil will snap it. It is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, that the Spirit uses in our lives. The Spirit's sword will strike some with conviction. It will strike others with conversion. And some with condemnation. But it works to go to the heart of man. And it is this sword that will grow you up and make you strong as you use it in your life to be victorious against Satan and his schemes. It is the word of God that slays man's pride and then saves his soul. Praise God. Amen. In Matthew 4, when Jesus was tempted and tested by the devil in the wilderness, he countered every temptation and every scripture uh, 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 and uh, scripture twisting to Satan with the, with the sword of the word. And he would say, it is written. Verse 4, 7 and 10. You see, Jesus himself was an expert in swinging the sword of the Spirit. The word of God setting the example for us today. Praise God, Jesus has set every example for us to live by. Every effort of the devil to derail you, my friends, to derail you through disobedience, doubt, disbelief, deceit, or discouragement, it can be countered with the Word of God. It can be countered with the sword of the Spirit, His very Word. You, when you know the Word of God, 
every scheme of the devil can be dragged into the light and destroyed by the truth of God's word. Praise God for that. One of Satan's greatest and most successful methods today as we get here near the close. That is crippling the church today. And I mean crippling the lives of believers and causing untold casualties is that of stripping the church of the word of God. Stripping the church of your only weapon, the word of God in your life. There's nothing more that Satan wants to do. Biblical illiteracy within the professing church has reduced the sword of the spirit to a spiritual squirt gun. And we can say, that can't be the case. Let that not be the case in my life. The church today must get back to the world. The church must preach the word from the pulpits today. The church must proclaim the word of God in its classes, in its Sunday schools, in its pulpits. Everything the church says must be backed up by God's word. And the church individually must be back into the word of God in their individual lives. Souls are at stake. Lives are at stake. Victory and defeat lay in the balance. What about you, personally? Has Satan and his deceptiveness stripped you of your sword? Are you that person who says, I'm in the Word every day. I listen to my Bible verse once a day. I listen to the verse of the day. I do my daily bread and read my verse of the day. Or I get my, I get my uh, devotions on the radio when I'm listening to Kayla. I hear all these things. I'm told this with sincerity quite often. We must realize that Satan has stripped us of the sword. Has he kept you so busy in your life, even in legitimate things, and filled your days with so many worldly pursuits, so many pleasures, that he's turned your eyes to every form of media rather than turned your eyes to his word? Has this happened? Remember something. Satan and his military have perfected their schemes. And the major one is to deceive the believer that they do not need to feed on the Word of God each and every day. Do you know that that's one of his major schemes against us? Pew Research. Lifeway Research. There's new research out today. I want to read this to you. Lifeway Research study found only 45% of regular attending believers, only 45% read their Bible more than once a week. The majority of those 45% is two to three times, more closer to two times, less than five minutes a week, if you're in that 45%. That's your highest tier. That's where, how low the bar has fallen. 40% read their Bible once or twice a month. And one in five, 20% never read their Bible. Mm. So if you come to me in counseling, or you come to me with spiritual issues, you will hear me ask you a question. Have you done the math? I take everybody to math, as we do talk about other things. (laughs) But have we done the math? What happens When you do the math, you will see if if Satan has stripped you of your sword, if he has deteriorated your love of your first love, Jesus. If the math shows it, you're a casualty in the spiritual battle. You're a casualty waiting to happen or already happening. This math is based on a person who comes to Sunday school. So if you don't come to Sunday school, automatically start lowering your math He comes to, he or she comes to Sunday morning worship and they come to Wednesday evening. So if you don't come Wednesday evening and you don't come to Sunday school, you're falling lower. This is about all times corporately and individually in the Word of God. We're not talking about radio. We're not talking about anything other form of intervention. We're talking about your time in the Word, either in church or with yourself at home. I hear all the time from brothers and sisters who are wrestling with depression, anxiety, loneliness, saying something is missing in my life, wrestling with constant temptation, wrestling with defeat, or they just have lost a lack of zeal for the Lord. 
And the list goes on. And when you dig deeper, when you dig deeper, you will find that the root core analysis of almost every single time, you will find a lack of being consistently in the Word of God as one factor, one of the factors. 45% who read five minutes, three times per week, along with 45 minutes of Sunday school, 45 minutes of morning worship, and 30 minutes of Wednesday night devotion, based on a 17 hour waking day. I've given you seven hours to sleep, 17 hour waking day, are with the Lord 1% of the time. See the math? 0.0189 you spend with God. Same equation with those who miss Sunday school and this Wednesday night church, but let's say they make it to morning worship service, and let's say most likely they're not, but let's say they're in the Word too, five minutes a day, two to three times a week. Look at them, 0.0084, not even 1% of their time is spent with their Savior in fellowship, in devotion, in listening to what He has to say to us. But let's say this, let's say every day, You're on fire. You spend 10 minutes per day in the Word, plus you get to each and every service. You're 10 minutes every day. Guess what? You've now got to 2% of your total week with God. 2.0.02. If you spend 30 minutes per day in the Word, plus hit all these services, you now have got up to 4% of your total week with the Lord. If you're really on fire and a real big uh, uh, person who's in the Word fighting and you spend 60 minutes every day in the Word, plus come to each and every service, you now have got up to 6% of your total time of your week spending with God. We don't do the math. We lie to ourselves, deceive ourselves, which is really Satan, our sin natures, demonic forces, and we think we're doing better than we are. Please hear me. These numbers show the church is in real trouble collectively and is in real trouble individually. Is it any wonder why so many people have forgot their first love? Why so many people compromise and live with defeat in their life? Why so many people look like the world and actually have the audacity to argue with you and tell you that you're crazy? When it's right in the Word of God. Oh, people, please. Let's get back to loving His Word. Let's get back to picking up our sword. You see, I don't need an M1. I don't need an M16. I've got this. We've got this. You've got the sword. And you could use this to feed and grow and begin to build a relationship with Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. Love it. Hug it. Smell it. Live it, eat it, know it. It will change your life. And you will be used as a mighty, powerful instrument in the hand of Almighty God. And you know, those of you who tell me, and I hear this too, well, Pastor, I don't read very well. That's Satan. There are audio of the Word of God. Open your phone, download it, and listen to God's Word be read to you. Amen. We are in a battle. This doesn't have to be you. It doesn't have to be me. We have orders and God offers to us his weapon for victory. So take it. If Satan has taken away your sword, no worries. It's okay. You can take it back. If he's taken away your sword, get it back again and start uh, yielding it. Start learning it. Get alone with God, my friends, every day. Get alone with God without fail in his word and use it to find the longing and love that God wants you to have for Him. Use it to see the longing and love God has for you. The comfort and courage you will find. The strength and steadfastness that will be yours. Wisdom and the will to live victoriously in doing the will of God and pleasing Him. And blessing will be yours. Amen. Praise God. You will love the Lord from your heart as He richly will dwell in you. And have aspects to all areas of your home as you fellowship with Him daily. Don't steal your time from God. It's so needed in your life in the church today. If you're here today, 
If you're here today, Kayla, come on. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, the battle can be yours. Jesus Christ came and he did what we couldn't do. He died on the cross to pay the price for our sin. So that if we believe in him, we will not perish, but he will give us eternal life. There's no more need for you to live in defeat. No more need for you to live in death. You have the ability to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let him come into your life, richly dwell in you. Then you have the wonderful knowledge that the Holy Spirit will indwell you. And that from this moment on, you will be a new creation and he will walk with you and talk with you and guide you and bring you into his purpose as you give him glory in your life. He will change you eternally. Dear Lord, I just thank you today. I thank you for your word. Lord, let us remember what type of battle we are in. Lord, let us march with your orders to stand firm, to stay strong, to resist. But Lord, let us take up the whole armor of God. You've given it to us. It fits each one of us perfectly. Lord, let us use your sword. Let's not Lord, please, let us not be deceived and be away from your word. Let us recognize its power through you. In your name I pray. Amen.